Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So, at Russell's request, or suggestion, I researched various, uh, various proofs of the ergodic theorem and the subadditive ergodic theorem. So these are classical theorems going back um, <laughs> almost uh, 100 years in the case of the ergodic theorem and to the 70s for the subadditive ergodic theorem. Um, the original proofs uh, you know, were, quite, were quite hard since then many shorter and simpler proofs were found. Some of the shortest proofs using the maximal ergodic theorem are not so intuitive. So I want to present proofs that are uh, perhaps more intuitive following uh, works of uh, Kamai, Benji Weiss, Katz Nelson, and Mike Keane, and Mike Steele. So it will be um, product of these. So the ergodic theorem of Birkhoff can be stated in a measure theoretic form or a probabilistic form. In the probabilistic form, we have a stationary ergodic process, so xj. So, right, so this process is uh, <coughs> is stationary, meaning that the uh, the law of any sequence, say, x1, x2, up to xn, is the same as, as the law of a shift, x2, x3, up to x plus 1. And you can, this is true for all n, and it follows from this shift invariance that you can shift by more than 1. In other words, if we look at the transformation t that sends just the sequence xj to the sequence xj plus 1, this transformation is measure preserving. And so our measure is a probability measure. And then we'll also assume this assumption can be, can be removed, but in the applications, Often the process is ergodic, which means that um, if you have any, if so, we, we assume that the process is ergodic, which means if uh, if we have an invariant event or invariant function. So if f is any function of of the process, which is measurable and satisfies, okay, I'll write measurable, and, and it's shift invariant, so f is pointwise equal, not just in distribution, but pointwise equal to its composition with t, then, then f is constant almost everywhere, almost surely. And, and this assumption is satisfied in many cases. In particular, uh, so in particular, this holds holds in the independent case, but in many more cases. So, if the xj are independent, then in this uh, invariance, invariance certainly implies that it's constant. OK, so in that uh, setting, the ergodic theorem would just say that if we look at the partial sum, so let me uh, write more generally. So the partial sum of size L starting at k will be the sum of xj uh, plus k when j ranges from 0 to l minus 1. 
Okay, so we'll be interested in the partial sums from various places. And then we have the normalized partial sum, or the average, AL of K, is 1 over L, uh, SL of K. And then the, uh, then the theorem states that a n of k for any k, but it's enough to talk about, say, a n of 1. This converges to the mean, say, the expectation of x1. Of course, by stationarity, they all have the same mean. This converges uh, almost surely. So that's the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. Later, we'll discuss the subadditive version. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so let's, any questions on the statement? Okay, so there are two, there are really two parts to the statement. One is that this actually converges, and then, the, which is the, maybe the general, the harder part, and then identifying that the limit is, as you expect, the mean of x1. Any, any questions or something unclear? So regarding the property of the distribution of the xj. It's a property of the distribution of the xj and of the transformation, t. Okay, so, yeah, so maybe you know, a word about what this means. You can, instead of invariant functions, you can think just of invariant events. So an event, uh, b is invariant if t inverse of b equals b, and it's equivalent to just assume that all invariance events have probability 0 or 1. So that's another form of ergodicity. And okay, and yet, yet another form is that you know for any <coughs> two sets of positive measure, if you apply t enough times to one, it will intersect the other at positive measure. So you cannot have kind of two sets of positive measure that don't see each other when you apply t. Okay, so that's so that's about the statement. So so I want. As I said, there are several short proofs. I want to give the one that is, is most, most intuitive and also generalizes to the subadditive case. So, uh, so as I said, this proof starts with the ideas of Tetsuro Kamai, then uh, there is who wrote a proof in non-standard analysis. Then um, this was simplified by Katznelson and Weiss, and, and then by Keane, and it's basically his version that I'll show today. Okay, so, so first, uh, so we want to, uh, so first I want to say that it's enough, uh, it's enough to consider positive variables, so we may assume all the xj are non-negative, because in general you just separate into the positive and the negative parts and prove it separately. Right? So, so you just uh, write x as a difference of a positive and a negative part and write, work with each one separately and get the result. So once we prove everything here is kind of linear, so once we prove it for the positive part, we prove it for the negative part, can just subtract and get it. So we it's enough to deal it with this case. Mr. Butler, yes. Q, is an i is the same as an j, right? No. The limit is the limit is the same. But again, a n one is the limit a n, right? We're summing these are partial sums from different locations, right? So But there's the shift invariance, so does it So the shift invariance is of the distributions, right? So x1 is not equal to x2, it's just its distribution is yes, the same. Sure. So the distribution, but so a1 is definitely not a2, but it has the same distribution. Right. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so of course, and also, you know, it's easy to see that the, they must have the same limit. So a and, right, so I wrote here a and 1, but it applies to a and k for any k. This is a limit, right, as n tends to infinity. Right, but okay, so 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 look at the limb soup. 
of the ANs. And okay, so instead, I'm going to try and make this proof as intuitive as possible, which means not exactly the same as the shortest possible. So I want to first consider kind of an easy case, which we'll then generalize. So okay, maybe one more definition before that. So we have the limb soup. Uh, we fix an alpha, which is less than the limb soup. By the way, this limb soup, we a priori don't know if, that it's finite at all, even though. So maybe I should have we want added, added the assumption. So we have stationary ergodic, and I want to assume that it's integrable. So assume that the expectation of the variables is finite. So let's add that. OK to make this statement meaningful. Okay. Um, so, so we look at this limb soup, which a priori don't know it's finite. So we know it's in you know, zero infinity. It might at this stage be infinite, but we'll prove it's finite. Okay. If we were talking about the limb inf, it would be immediate that it's finite from Fatou's lemma, but we're talking about the limb soup, so there's something still to prove. Okay. So fix alpha, which is less than the limb soup, and then <laughs> let's say L of k, these will be random variables. These are the first time that you exceed, that the averages exceed this limb soup. So the first L, so that A L of k exceeds alpha. Okay, alpha is certainly fin a finite number. So, so by the definition of limb soup, this number is, is certainly finite. But it might be very large. Okay, we might have to wait for long. So, so case one is when these numbers are uniformly bounded. So, so this is very special. You know, it happens for some ergodic sequences, like periodic sequences, but it will be a good warm-up for the general case. So suppose that these L of Ks are bounded, uniformly bounded by some L. This is just a special atypical case. And we'll see what to do in this case and then generalize from that. So, so in this case, we just uh, take the partial sum and write it. Um, so Basically, we, we're, the idea is to take the interval from 1 to n and cover it by intervals where the partials, where the averages exceed alpha. So, so we know there is some interval here where the average exceeds alpha. And this length of this interval, right? so this is this L of 1, the length of this interval is at most L. And then we find another interval where the partial sum exceeds alpha and so on. And we know that all these intervals are no longer than L. So, so we stop the first time we cross N minus L. And this decomposition of this series, let's write it now in more formally. So I want to say that the sum of xj, j from 1 to N, this is going to be bigger than the sum i from 1 to some m. Of, of, of partial sums. So this will be partial sums from some uh, k, from some number. OK, let's write. These are L of ki at ki. OK. so. And I'll, I'll write some more and then explain. This is going to be bigger than, a, than the sum of L of ki times alpha, which will be bigger than n minus L times alpha. And here, 
where each time we choose k, uh, so we start with k1 is 1, and ki plus 1 will just be ki plus uh, L of ki. Right, so each time we start at 1, we find an interval where the partial sums are large, then we just go to the next, right? So we find this interval, then we go to the next point, find a good, another good interval, and so on. So all these partial sums are larger than um, their length times the average, right? Because the, this is greater than alpha. So we get this inequality, and then and the length of all these intervals will exceed n minus l, because we just keep going as long as we can. And we just have to stop. Once we exceed n minus l, it's possible that the length, next interval will overshoot n, so we stop at that point. We don't take the next interval. Okay. Now, I didn't. This inequality is, you know, completely obvious after you've seen it, and maybe confusing the first time you see it. So please stop me because this is. Uh, so apologies for those to whom it's trivial, and apologies to those for whom it's confusing, but anyone from the second group wants to ask something? Is this, because this is really the crux of the whole matter, so. Well, probably should have mentioned that a bar doesn't depend, I mean, that it doesn't depend on L. It's the same case yes, for A and That's a important, thank you. So, so that I should have mentioned that a bar is a constant, so thank you. So that's right. So a bar this slim soup. Thanks. Um, so maybe at this point I should have mentioned it. So a bar is. So uh, observe, note that a bar equals a bar composed with t. It is if, in other words, if we. This is uh, related to Anup's comment. So. If we start the partial sums from 1 or from 2, it not only it has the same distribution, but point-wise, the partial sums only differ by the first variable. So when we divide by n and take a limit or a limb soup, it doesn't matter. So point-wise, the limb soup of the sequence starting from the first or the limb soup starting from the second, when we divide by n, clearly easy to see it has the same limb soup. So, so we have this invariance. Which means, because we're working in the ergodic case, so a, so a bar is a constant, almost sure. <coughs> OK, so thanks, Sofer. I should have commented on that. It's yes? not just the first term that it differs, but it actually is the last term. That's a little right. bit more. Yeah, so, so uh, it's. <laughs> So the, we want it only to differ in the first term. So what? So maybe I'll, I'll say this. So a n, so uh, you know a n of one, you know equals a n minus one of two. Um, so maybe I'll write okay s n of one equals s n minus one of two plus uh, plus x one. Okay, so that's better. So because uh, you know the last term we don't control well, but okay, so now, <coughs> right? So now divide, right? So so a n of one equals you know n minus one over n, a n minus one of two, plus x one over n, and now it's safe to take them soups. Okay, so. Sorry, this, <laughs> this is to formally justify this. Ah, yeah. Okay, so what Offer pointed out is that if we just work with averages of length n, then partial sum of length n from 1 and from 2, they differ by a last element, which kind of varies in time. So we don't control it well. We could, but it's easier just to look at the, just to use this identity, which compares partial sum of n terms to partial sum of n minus 1 terms. 
And, and now, once we have it in this form, we really, can take, we really can take the limb soup and see this goes to zero, this factor doesn't matter, and so we indeed derive this identity. Okay, so okay, so in this case, we're basically done, at least with the existence of the limit, because, and we can e easily finish the rest, because now if you take uh, if you take these two sides. Right, you divide by n and take a limb in. So you get that the, uh, so here, can, so the limb in of, I'll just write it out, 1 over n sum xj, j equals 1 to n, is going to be, well, we take this divide by n and take a limb in for limit as n tends to infinity. So this is greater than alpha. Okay, and of course, if we could do this for any alpha less than a bar, then we would get that the limit equals the limb soup, and so the limit exists. But of course, this assumption that L is constant is uh, very restrictive. So now, uh, I don't want to spell out the details in this case. This case was more just to see the key the key argument in the cleanest setting. Now we're going to just do that uh, same thing in the, in the general case. So, so in the general case, we can't assume that these LKs are bounded. Uh, but um, what we can do is, you know, given, given epsilon small, uh, we, can pick, we can pick a large number L so that the probability that LK, okay, this probability doesn't depend on K, but the probability that this is bigger than L will be less than epsilon. Okay, again, by stationarity, this probability is the same for any K, so I could have put here just L of one. Okay? So the point is this L of K is a finite number, so it's a finite random variable, but so I can put in L large, so the probability this variable is bigger than that, is less than epsilon. And now we want to modify the process so that, sorry, so xk star will be xk in the case when L of k is less than L. These are somehow well-behaved cases. And in the bad cases, so going to look ahead, and if the situation is bad, so we need to wait too long, then we're just going to modify the process and put an alpha here. Okay? This is the modified process xk star, and I want to write it as xk plus zk. Right, so zk is usually zero, just when we are in this case, zk will be, you know, alpha minus xk. All right? So, so we define xk this star this way, and now the and and define this you know uh, right so so al star of k are the averages uh, averages of the xk star the x right so xj plus k j from zero to l minus one. And, and L, and then we have L star of K is the first L, so that these averages, A L star of K, exceed alpha. And now we're in a good position. These are always at most L. X star, thank you. Yes, that's the whole point. These are averages of the x stars. And, and now, because L star of k, in fact, it's, usually, it's L of k 
if L of k is less than L, and it's 1. Right, so, right, so L star k is going, so L star of k, what is it? It's L of k if L of k is less than L, and it's 1 otherwise. Okay, so it's certainly always at most, at most L. So now the previous argument applies, and just partitioning the partial sum, sum i from, so now we're going to take n, which is much, much larger than L, intuitively, and we're going to take the sum, so the sum j from 1 to n of x j star is going to be bigger by the same argument from before, because we're in a situation uh, of n minus L times alpha. Okay, so it's convenient that all the variables here are non-negative, so, so terms that we throw away here at the end, we know they're non-negative. Okay, so it's exactly the same argument from before, now proves us, proves us this inequality, which is really the, you know, the key, <coughs> key inequality of this step. Right? Any, any questions? So it's exactly the argument because we are in that situation where we only have to sum at most capital L terms to get the, uh, you know, to get the average that we want. All right? So now what uh, we can do with this, several things. So first let's take expectations on, on both sides. So we get that n times expectation of x1 star is greater than n minus L alpha. And what can we say about this? Well, look at x1 star. It only differs in this case. So it's at most, a, this is n times expectation of x1 plus alpha epsilon. Right? Because the difference is just the expectation of this z, of this z1, and that difference is at most alpha and with probability at most epsilon. Okay, so now, now we're in a good situ situation. We can take, we can divide by n and take a limit as n tends to infinity and we'll get that expectation of x1 is greater than uh, 1 minus epsilon times alpha, okay, moving the epsilon to the other side. And this we could do, note that here it's, now it's x1, it's not x1 star anymore, so this is true for any epsilon, so you get expectation of x1 is greater than or equal alpha, but this was true for any alpha less than a bar, so we can conclude that expectation of x1 is in fact a greater than a bar, which is a kind of powerful inequality here, because a bar was the limb soup. So we conclude that this limb soup is in fact finite and bounded above by the expectation. Okay, so now we're almost done. We just still have to argue that the limb inf of the x's gives us the, is also, is also a bar. And to this we go, for this we just go back to this, um, <coughs> Yes. Yeah, but uh, the the point that we used it is, I mean, at the end we to, we to, we use the fact that this is true for any epsilon. Right. Once we had this, right, we got this inequality, and now we say this is true for any positive epsilon. So e x one is in fact greater than alpha. Okay. And then we said this is true for any alpha less than a bar. So in fact, e x one is. is bigger than a bar. So now in order to go back, notice that the x star have two pieces, have this x and the z. So let's make sure we can control the z's well, and for this we're going to use what we've already proved for the process x, we're going to use it for the process z. So, um, so we, expectation of, so 
So this fact that we've already proved implies when applied to the process Z, which is after all just another stationary process, a stationary ergodic process, that the expectation of Z1 is going to be um, bigger than the lim soup 1 over n sum j equals 1 to n of the zj, almost surely. <laughs> and be, right, so the, the z's are a function uh, are a function of the x process, and so and so they're also also ergodic. So any So if you have if you have an, any ergodic any ergodic process and you apply uh, you apply a function of that, then you, <laughs> you also get an ergodic process and you just check that from the from the from the definition. Thanks, Russ. So. All right, so, sin, so, so this is something that should be added. Since the z's are a function and an invariant function of the, uh, of the original process, they're also an ergodic process. So we, get, so we get this inequality. Now we want to apply that going back to our key inequality upstairs here. So, um, so that inequality tells us that maybe I'll also write that expectation of Z1 we know is at most alpha epsilon. Okay, now let's write this inequality as a, in the form okay, 1 over n sum j from 1 to n of xj plus sum j from 1 to n of the zj is at least n minus well over n times alpha. Okay, now, now we want to take limit for both sides. Well, here it just converges to alpha. What can we say about uh, about the limit of this side? Well, the on the one hand it's bigger, so so we take the limit. And on the one hand, it's bigger than alpha from that inequality. On the other hand, it's certainly, well, what can we bound it above? It's not true that the limit is bounded above by uh, the sum of the limit, but it's certainly true that it's bounded above by the lim inf of the, of the x's plus the lim soup of the z's. Right? So this is just true for any two sequences. But when we add them, we can bound Right, we can bound above the limb inf by the limb soup of one and the limb inf of the other. Okay? But, <laughs> right, so this is limb inf of a n of one plus, and this we know, so can be bounded above by alpha epsilon. This is greater than alpha. And so we're in the same situation we wanted before, we move alpha epsilon to the other side. And so we get that the, this, so, so this lim inf is in fact greater than alpha. So this, so it follows that this lim inf is in fact greater than a bar. So it's equal to a bar and we have the convergence. Okay. And we've already verified that um, See what right, 
right? So we have convergence to So a bar okay so <clears throat> so here I guess I've explained why a bar is at most is at most the expectation um, why is I didn't say why a bar is a, why a bar is at least the expectation so this So this is the final note. So, so, so this is at mo the fact that it's at most expectation we've proved. Now in in the bounded case, if the x's were bounded, we certainly know that. Uh, a bar would be equal to ex1 just from the Lebesgue bounded convergence theorem because all the averages will be bounded by the same bound, and so and so uh, in in general, a bar is bigger than the limit of one over n sum j from one to n of the minimum of xj with m. Which is right, so this is now a bounded process. So this gives us expectation of x1 minimum m. So a bar is is bigger. X j minimum with a large number m. This wedge is a minimum. Right, so again, in the bounded case, just Lebesgue bounded convergence theorem gives you that the, the expectation of the limit is the limit of expectations. In the unbounded case, you just truncate, you get this inequality, and now once we have this inequality, you can let m tend to infinity, and you get that a bar will also be greater or equal than the x1, just by taking m to infinity. Okay, so any questions about this? All right, so as I said, there are other proofs. This one is particularly well adapted to generalization to the uh, subadditive case. Uh, historically, when the Kingman pr first proved the subadditive ergodic theorem in the 70s, the proof was much harder. Um, so I'm, I'll go on to that if there are no questions on this case. And despite the name subadditive ergodic theorem, I'm going to prove the superadditive version so, but it's just up to negate, taking minuses. So we're going to, uh, <coughs> so, so what's, what's a super additive process? So maybe, um, so maybe first, just, just one word on the kind of places where Subadditive ergodic theorems get applied. So one place is when you, in first passage percolation, you have say a lattice, and you want to, and on the edges you have random variables which indicate passage times, and you want to find t of zero n is the time to go from zero to n. In general, t of m n might be the time to go from m to n on the x-axis. So we have two points, you know, m and 
and n on the x-axis, we look at all possible paths that go from one to the other. Uh, for each path, we look at the total passage time of the path, and we minimize over all these paths. So on the edges are endowed with independent random variables, which are you know, passage time of these edges. So, so these random variables, it's easy, easy to see that they're subadditive. So the time to go from 0 to n is certainly bounded by the time to go from 0 to m plus the time to go from m to n. Because here we're considering a larger ensemble of paths that go from 0 to n. Here we're considering paths that, on the right-hand side, we're considering paths that go from 0 to m but have to go via the intermediate point m. So here we're minimizing over a larger ensemble of paths. So this is the kind of quality. And then you want to show that when you take the time to go from 0 to n, you divide by n. This actually has a limit. And the limit is non-random. So it's almost really constant. And it's equal to the limit of the expectations. So this is one kind of application. Another application is for random walks on groups. Um, and you want to show that the random walk has a speed. So you have some Cayley graph. You're doing a random walk in the Cayley graph. And you look at the distance from your starting point to the nth point in your walk. And again, you can check that that satisfies um, such an inequality and, and so get existence of, of a limit. So I won't talk now about more applications, but rather go to the formal statement since I want to finish in time. So the so the subadditive ergodic theorem of Kingman, and I'm going to state it in superadditive version. So so again, we can think of some underlying probability space. A, so is some so in this case the probability space is um, just all the edges on all the dis the random variables that indicate the passage times of the edges and you can think of a transformation t from omega to itself which is measure preserving And, and then the important things are random variables uh, y, m, n. So you can think of these as, say, the negative of these passage times. Um, <laughs> OK, and y, m, n, uh, they satisfy the subadditive inequality. So just write y, 0, n is, is, I'm sorry, the superadditive. So this is bigger than y a 0 m plus y m n. So, so that's one assumption. And also the shift in variance in distribution. So y m n composed with t is y m plus 1 n plus 1. So you see, in this situation, the transformation is just uh, shifting the random variables. And, and you see that the time to go from m plus 1 to n plus 1 it just has the same law as the time to go from m to n. And it just corresponds to the shifted passage times. OK, so this, these are the assumptions. And then the conclusion is that if you take what? So, no, this is, this is a little confusing. This is not equality in distribution. This is, uh, this is the actual random variables. Okay, so, T is measure preserving. That's right. OK, so you should you really think there's really just one sequence of, just like in the ergodic theorem. Um, yeah, so 
So here you should. Okay, so the, you think of your basic variables as these these y m n these or y zero n, and then from y zero n you can, and the transformation you have all the variables. Okay, but the transformation just shifts the underlying space. Okay, so then. Uh, right, then the conclusion is that there exists uh, the limit of y zero n. This limit exists almost surely. Um, now beta is some number. It's not in this case. It's not minus infinity, but it could well be infinity. Okay, the numbers y, these are finite numbers, but I didn't assume integrability here, so certainly averages could go to infinity. Um, okay, and also uh, beta is also the limit of the expectations. Okay, so the proof is You see, it follows the same same lines as before. So, so we're going to. So first, if you look at the variables y tilde m n, which are y m n <coughs> minus the sum y k minus one k, k from m plus one to n then you could just see that the super additivity assumption implies that this is non-negative. Okay, so leave that as a little verification. You just recursively apply this, this assumption again and again. And remember that this assumption together with the one on the right implies that we have the super additivity along any interval. If you take the interval and break it in two pieces, y of the big interval is bigger than y's of the, the the sum of the y's of the pieces, right? And and you just keep breaking it up until you get to uh, to this y on intervals of length one, and so so this is non-negative, and okay. So and um, and this partial sum can be treated with the with the ergodic theorem so okay if <laughs> so okay there's if this if these variables have infinite expectation then you easily conclude that ev that the limit is infinite if they have a finite expectation then you can just use the ergodic theorem that tells you that the averages of these will go to their mean and you just reduce the case of ymn to the case of y tilde. So because of such a definition, um, so this allows us to assume that the original ymn are non-negative. So okay. you are assuming that y has an integral uh, including plus or minus infinity. Um, Yes, so right, so let's okay, 
Yes, that's right. Okay, so. So why is integrable or non negative? Yes. Okay, so let's first of all assume that these y's are. Assume that these are finite. Okay. So, thanks. So then, all right. So this allows us to assume that the ymn are non-negative. So now we just continue with non-negative variables and define as before. So a. So, I guess now I'll call it beta. the limb soup of the uh, one over n y zero n okay we fix alpha less than beta And uh, define, like before, L of k is the first first L, so that when we take y from uh, k to k plus L, this is bigger than L alpha. And L star of k. So now L star of k will be L of k if L of k is less than L, and 1 if L of k is bigger than L. Okay, now the same logic that we've used already twice before will allow us to bound from below y0n. Okay, by um, something n minus, essentially n minus l times alpha. I'll write it and then explain minus the sum um, over all So I didn't tell you how we choose l, but you can already guess. I'll write it down in a moment. So uh, the sum over all k so that L of k is okay. And here we choose L as before. We choose L so that the probability of L of k. to be bigger than L is less than epsilon. And then we, so these L star k, we don't really use them. They just kind of remind us of the argument to get this inequality. Okay, to get this inequality, we take the, as before, we take the interval 0, n, and we start, we look from 0, we look, do we have an interval here where L of k is less than L? If so, we're happy, um, and then we continue. But maybe here, when we look here, the L of k is bigger than L. Then we just take a singleton, and we go to the next point. Okay? So, but this singleton was a special point where L of k was bigger than L. Then we go to the next point, and so we, overall, we cover the whole interval from n to n from zero to n minus L by good intervals where L of k is less than L and bad singletons. So when we had when L of k is bigger than L, we just take that singleton as and, and jump to the next. So overall from the good intervals, we'll get n minus L times their times their length, but we're going to lose and here um, yeah, so I have we're going to uh, lose from this. So we have this also uh, the alpha multiplies this as well. Maybe I'll write it this way. So 
sorry, n minus l minus the sum, all of this multiplies alpha. Right, so the total length of the good intervals is at least n minus l minus the sum of the bad locations, the number of the bad locations. Okay, in the bad locations, we had to go to the next point. Okay, this, this is somehow the key to this proof, but it's similar to the keys to the previous proof. So that's why we went through that. If you have a bad location, then the next one is not going to be bad as well? Um, maybe. But you see, it's not, it's not, uh, not it might, it, it kind of does give some negative information, but this is not the, right, note this, here I'm not computing probabilities. This is just a combinatorial pointwise inequality, right, that says we, we gain alpha times the length of the good intervals, and we lose I mean, but what is the total length of the good intervals? It's at least n minus l minus the number of the bad singletons. Every time we see a bad singleton, we go to the next. Maybe that's another bad singleton. But then it will just enter into this sum. So the total length of the good intervals is at least what's written in the parentheses here. And then from them, we get this times alpha. OK? Um, yeah, it's essentially, it's essentially the same. What is different here is that we didn't do actually a modification of the process for this. We just kind of paid the price here. But we're in a better position than before because we already have the ergodic theorem and we, for the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and we're about to use it. Okay, so that's why we didn't have to go through the same thing because now when we divide by n and take, uh, and we want to take a limit, you see these are now these are just, these indicators are just uh, a sequence of station, because everything is a function of a stationary, uh, of a stationary process. These indicators, if we check, they're also stationary. So if we divide by n and take a limit, we know they converge to the expectation of this indicator. So, and that expectation is just the probability of this event, which is small, it's less than epsilon. So, so thus, if we take divide by n and take a liminf, what do we get? Well, here when we, l is constant, so when we divide by n, we're going to get at least alpha minus um, well alpha times one minus the probability of L, say, of 1 bigger than 1, which is bigger than sorry, L of 1 bigger than L. So this is bigger than alpha times 1 minus epsilon. OK, and at this point, we use the birkhoff ergodic theorem for these random variables, which again, because we're in a stationary situation, these themselves from a stationary sequence, so we can apply the birkhoff ergodic theorem here. And now we're done. The limit here is um, greater than alpha, and this was true for any alpha less than beta, so the limit equals the value. So, um, so the last comment is why is the limit the same as the limit of the expectations? So you always have, right? So so we, we already proved, so the limit of y0 n over n exists and equals beta. <coughs> so, so then from, from Fatou, uh, if we take expectation, we get that the um, expectation of the limit, which is beta, is, is at most the limit in f of the expectations. But this is a super additive numerical sequence, so the limit exists. So, so the limit exists, and, and so beta is at most this limit. In the other direction, just observe that uh, if you take y0 and say k times n, <laughs> 
you can break this up into um, n intervals of, of length k, right? So, so if you take this and divide by n and take a limit, this will be bigger than the expectation of y zero k. Okay, because just from the subadditive inequality, you can, or, or the superadditive inequality, you can break this up into a sum of n summons each on intervals of length k, and and then for these summons, you apply the ordinary ergodic theorem, and to get that when you divide these, this is sum of n summons. When you divide by n, you'll get this limit. This is true for every k. So now let's take this. So here I thought of n as tending to infinity, and k is constant. So I can. Right, so I have this, and this is true. This is this is exactly our limit beta, and it's bigger than this for every k. So taking a limit gives us the remaining inequality we need. OK, since I promised to finish at 5, I won't really discuss more applications now. But um, any, let me stop here and wait for any questions. Yes? So what was the benefit of taking uh, the y's to be non-negative? So, We had some, in this inequality here, right, what did we do? We take the interval 0n and we broke it into good intervals and bad singletons, right? Now in the bad singletons, all I said is, well, you know, we don't get the good contribution, but we know we get something at least 0, so that's why I could write this inequality. So this gave us, what is in the parenthesis is just the total length of the good intervals, and those all give us alpha times their length. The other things I don't know, but it's non-negative. Right? Also the last L, that's right. Yes, because we stopped before the end and Okay, so that's where where that gets used. Okay, there are no more so you, you mentioned that the first proof used a non-standard analysis? No, 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 not the, f not the first proof. The first proof along this argument. So the Kingman proof no, right, was right, okay, right. classical. Just, but this uh, is, so, uh, so this, this line of proof started with the non-standard analysis proof by Tetsuro Kamei in 1982. And then uh, this was, you know, so, Izika Nelson and Ben Chi Weiss read that proof, understood it, and understood how to remove the non-standard analysis. Mm -hmm. But they still, but it, and then this was further simplified a bit by Mike Keane and Mike Steele, who gave these, uh, arg essentially these arguments for the ergodic, for the Birkhoff case and the subadditive ergodic case. You want to compare to other proofs, you can, so say Durrett's probability book has a proof for the subadditive ergodic theorem, Slightly more general version, but this one applies to most applications. This is the, what I proved to you is basically the original Kingman version. And, uh, but the proof that Durrett gives, which follows Ligate, is really much harder to follow and, and to remember. So here, I think at least the idea is pretty easy to remember. So, 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 so if you kind of use here non-standard analysis, will the proof even simpler or no? Uh, you... The proof, if you assume various, I mean, but you prove a completely different statement. So it, if you want to verify that that statement is actually equivalent, it's much longer. <laughs> yes, sir. So what's the relation of this to maximal theorems? Uh, this is a way to avoid maximal theorem. So, so some there's a very short proof of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem that comes from the maximal ergodic theorem, and for and this was one of the roots of the original proofs. And uh, initially, it was thought, oh, this reduction is so easy, so the maximal ergodic theorem must be hard. But then Garcia came up with a very short proof of the maximal ergodic theorem. So, if you combine those, 
there is a very, you know, there is a proof even shorter than the one I presented going via maximal ergodic theory, but that one, that one is more mysterious, I'd say, even, um, even to the experts. The right, right. That's not uh, that one. That one doesn't translate directly to the subadditive. Okay, thanks.